Now we want to continue our univariate analysis. We're going to add a few measures to what we've already done. So let's go ahead and get back to our table in Excel. And we're going to add mean standard deviation skewness and kurtosis. All right, so in Excel, we can do all of these by adding some functions. And also, by the way, you'll notice that in our descriptives that we created earlier for age, all of those values are already here. So you can actually pull it from those descriptives if you like. Uh, let's go ahead and see how we can do that in our table. So for mean, we will use the Excel function average. Average is kind of the way most of us think in general terms about uh, the mean. Uh, what's the average? Well, when we ask that, we're, we really are asking what the mean is. So equals average. All right, so equals average. And then I am going to highlight just the numeric range for each of my numeric values that I want, 39.20703. And then I can do standard deviation equals standard deviation. Now this is one where you have a choice here. Standard deviation P means for an entire population. Standard deviation S is assuming you have a sample. And basically the difference there is you've got a denominator, I think that is either N or N minus one for a sample, just to give you a little bit more wiggle room. And you can see again, we've got a couple older standard deviation functions that will be deprecated at some point in the future. So let's use the new ones. And because this really is a sample, let's do the sample one, standard deviation sample, uh, again for age. So we'll choose our range of age again. Okay, you can see it's 14.04996. And just for grins, if we were to change that to population for the entire population, it doesn't change a ton, but you can see even in the uh, descriptives, it's uh, taking the sample approach. So that's typically, we assume we have a sample of uh, the entire population rather than the population itself. But depending on your data set, you can use uh, whichever one makes more sense. Next one, is skewness. So we're just going to type in skew. And again, we can just use the regular skew because this is a sample. And we'll see we come up with our skewness value 0.0556. And that reflects what we got from the data analysis add in. And then kurtosis equals kurt for the same age attribute and you can see my kurtosis is one uh, negative 1.24 all right so we can do a little bit of um, formatting here so let's say i want just two decimals and at that point i can copy over to my other numeric uh, attributes and then copy my na's for the others. So now I want to go back to my documentation. And what did we add? Uh, mean. And then I need to add a few more columns to my table. Standard deviation, skewness, kurtosis. And you can see I'm starting to squeeze this uh, a little bit more than I'd like. But um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go to my. No, nah, I'm not. So I can type in standard deviation, skewness, and kurtosis. And I'll make some of these other ones a little bit smaller.
All right. So we'll uh, have to do a little bit of formatting at some point to uh, make this a little bit better. But uh, for now, uh, we at least can record what we're doing. So now my age is uh, the mean is 39.21. Standard deviation, 14.05. Skewness, 0 0.06. and kurtosis, negative 1.25. All right, now there are a number of uh, thoughts on skewness and kurtosis, and ideally what we would like, so age was, uh, yeah, skewness 0.06. So ideally what we would like is skewness between negative one and one, kurtosis between negative one and one. Now we hold pretty tight to that rule in skewness, but in kurtosis, you sometimes uh, get some different schools of thought that say, well, if kurtosis is above one or below negative one, uh, that's a little bit of a cause for concern, but we don't really get alarmed until it's plus or minus three. And others may say, well, plus or minus three, we'll start uh, you know, becoming a little bit concerned and then uh, we'll have a cutoff of plus or minus five. All right, so different schools of thought on kurtosis, but uh, skewness, we pretty much stick with the plus or minus one. And just for consistency, you know, plus or minus one for skewness and kurtosis is probably something that we can use as a guideline uh, for this class. All right, so now I would just go in and finish filling in the rest of the values based on what I have here. But let's go over to Tableau. And so you can see I have uh, continued on. Now we already had skewness and kurtosis in Tableau. So uh, something to consider here is for some reason, Tableau calls the kurtosis measure excess kurtosis. But in reality, it's just the kurtosis measure. So 1.24, and you can see that agrees with the uh, kurtosis measure we had here, which was um, uh, 1.25, actually 1.24508 rounded. So the measures here I've got for age and that skewness score is uh, pretty amazing. And we'll take a look at that in a histogram in just a minute. All right, children, so that's a discrete variable. So you get kind of the blockiness of the distribution there where you just have it at the hash marks there. Charges. All right, so let's go and uh, do the same thing. And let's create a visualization for age. So you see, if I draw age into columns and rows, I get just this one data point, but if I click my show me, Tableau understands that uh, yeah, this might be something you want to create a histogram for. So I click histogram and Tableau makes the appropriate adjustments for me. It bins the age for me and creates a count for each bin. And in this case, it looks like the bin is going to be by individual age. So you can see I have a, what we call a pretty flat distribution there for age. So that means we're not following a normal distribution. It's flat. That's our negative kurtosis there. So you can see it's a lot flatter than you would expect from a regular distribution where I would have a distinctive peak right near my mean. Now I do have more instances in my 18 and 19 bins, but with the small numbers that we have across each bin, they don't pull that skewness too dramatically to the right. So anytime you see a long tail on the uh, right and more mass on the left, that's a positive skew. Um, a long tail to the left and positive mass over here, more mass over here would be a negative skew. All right, so we've got a little bit for age. So we'll just call this age histogram. And then we will repeat this process. We'll just do, let's see what's next. BMI, columns, rows, histogram, 
BMI histogram. And we can see here, this uh, looks uh, like a pretty close to a classic normal distribution curve. We can just go back and double check our BMI stats and see the skewness is pretty low. Uh, the kurtosis is also pretty low. So that explains the fact that we've got a pretty good looking distribution here for BMI. That does happen to with things like birth weight be one of those natural occurrences that does tend to occur in more or less a pretty normal distribution. All right, so let's create one more. We'll call this, we'll do this one for our children. So again, children and children have Tableau offer us a histogram. And you can see this one is skewed very much to the right. So we've got a positive skew way uh, weighted towards zero and one. And that's certainly illustrated by the skewness and kurtosis numbers here. So the skewness is almost one, close to that threshold. Looks like we'll be able to work with it, but certainly something that we want to uh, keep an eye on. So this is age, or no, children, histogram. And then finally, we can do one for the charges. And when we bring that in, We'll see the histogram for that. This is our most likely target variable. So this is a good one for us to look at. And you can see that's skewed quite a bit to the right. And if we do go and look at the charges chart, yeah, we do have well over one for both skewness and kurtosis. So we'll call this charges histogram. All right, uh, you can create histograms in Excel as well with its charting function. It's not quite as straightforward as it is in a Tableau because Tableau understands what you're trying to do to a large degree. So at this point, we're ready to now add our histograms to our ongoing documentation for data understanding. So let's take a look at that. And for now, um, I'll need to add some textual description of what we're doing here. Uh, but for now, I'm just uh, preparing my charts and visualizations and incorporating them into the documents. So uh, what I'll do now is I'm going to go down to the next page. I'll insert another continuous, no, next page section break and convert my document back to portrait so I can uh, now paste my histograms. They won't need quite as much uh, horizontal space. So I'll go ahead and do them in uh, the order we created them. And so I've got age histogram. I can just right click here and say copy image, title view, Caption, yeah, that'll be fine. So I click copy. And now I can just come in here and do a paste. And then I can size that a little bit if I want. Center it. And then I'll leave room for a caption, which I'll add, and then work my way down through the other ones. BMI histogram. So one of the things you want to do is make sure you do have a reasonably descriptive title. Uh, so that uh, is why I changed the tab names or the worksheet names within Tableau, but you can always override what's in this. Uh, right now, it, by default, Tableau takes the sheet name as the title for your uh, worksheet, but you can make it whatever you want. You could change the font size, the, the font itself, the color, etc. All right, so I'll take my BMI, copy that, and bring it into my Word document. And then same with children.
And of course, you're always welcome to get a little more um, creative with these and make them uh, more colorful if you want, or choose your own color scheme. And then charges, I will bring in the charges histogram. All right, so with a little resizing, and then some descriptive text to show, illustrate what I'm finding out about uh, these different variables. And, you know, I might want to put my descriptive text for each chart either just directly above it and below it while I discuss that particular variable. And then do the same thing for the other. That way I'm spacing my charts out a little bit and I'm not just presenting a big wall of uh, visuals with no context for the reader. All right, so that's something to consider as you're putting these documents together. How do I want to do it? Do I want to wrap my text around the visuals so that they don't overwhelm the user? Or can I just intersperse them periodically uh, in my text so that I've got um, uh, a good mix of text and visuals to guide the reader along? Now, you've probably seen this approach used in textbooks you've used in the past. So feel free to use that. And as a matter of fact, I encourage you to use that as you put your documentation together so that you're guiding the reader both visually and verbally as you uh, work your way through your analysis.